my name is Yongshen. Uh, the slide's good. I hope you guys can see. Okay, um, there won't be too much Elixir Phoenix code, unfortunately. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this new thing which I'm getting a bit uh, obsessed with, which is uh, new SQL, uh, a particular variant of that which is CockroachDB. Um, so, and the API app is basically a lunchbox API which somebody had put up in uh, Medium and I just took it and I adapted it so that I could do this demo. So, uh, to reduce the craft of that. So, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm from this company, oops, that's not too good. I'm from this company called Odd E. Uh, so, uh, locally, uh, it was started in Singapore by Bas uh, Vode. Um, who's a Dutch. Um, he's basically one of the premier guy in uh, Scrum. Uh, we do team and organizational coaching. Uh, we have a bunch of coaches which is uh, spread out in uh, Hangzhou, Shanghai, Japan, Seoul, and some elements in uh, US and uh, Sydney. Uh, myself being based in Singapore, I'm currently working with Credit Suisse. So uh, I embed myself as a developer. So one of our tenets or principles, which is you can't do agility without technical competency, which is why uh, developers like myself, we embed ourselves with teams and then we try to change their habits and teach them how to write code. So the agenda. Um, so everybody is well aware, Elixir, Erlang, perfect fit, um, let it crash, so on. But a lot of time uh, when you are building up the systems, there's a lot of taken for granted, which is uh, the last mile of your application, which is your persistent tier, right? So that's the weakest link. I'll go into a little bit, just a tiny little bit about new SQL and what it means uh, to be Dash, and then quite a lot more into CockroachDB, uh, which Cockroach does. Uh, to prove that uh, they are worth what they, they say. And I will go on to demonstrate some of the, the, the code that's being written. Um, by no means, there is a very exhaustive and um, uh, test done on all this uh, stuff that I talk, talked about. Most of them are from articles that I read about. I just kind of aggregated them, did some small POC. My day-to-day -day job, I don't touch Elixir Phoenix whatsoever. So yeah. and. Also, there's a lot of opinions involved here. So, um, I think everybody is familiar with uh, traditional RDBMS. It started in the 70s and then in uh, probably 78, uh, IBM DB2 came out and then in 86, uh, NC uh, SQL became the official. And for the next 10, 15 years, it has been the de facto standard. Oracle came along, Postgres came along, MySQL came along. And then there was a huge wave with e-commerce sites, uh, uh, mostly led by uh, the Ruby wave and whatnot, where NoSQL, working with Redis, MongoDB, and all those came around. However, it was obvious that something was missing. NoSQL no gave you the ability to do distribution. Uh, you could actually do scaling. Uh, but uh, the promise was that it didn't have the ability for transactions asset transactions which traditional RDBMS gave you. Um, it provided a near means to that which is known as eventual consistency. And if you can live with that, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then somewhere in 2012, Google released a paper called the Google Spana project. So that basically tried to do RDBMS, traditional RDBMS using asset in a scaled up way. And it provided an ability to guarantee asset transactions, but Google did it in a very uh, expensive way. They had um, atomic clocks in the data center, which is running the different nodes of their Google Spana uh, databases. So what uh, came along after that was Yugabyte DB, Tide DB, and CockroachDB. And CockroachDB being from a bunch of guys who were formerly working on the Spana project, they came out and they tried to open source the Spana project. Uh, and that's 2014 when they started. So before I go into a bit more about uh, Cockroach, um, I think everybody's familiar with the 12-factor application, what it means to be 12-factor. But um, recently I came across uh, an article uh, which talks about uh, what it means to be cloud-native ready. So if you are deploying to the cloud and you want to be able to scale, uh, there are four uh, principles which 
applies both to your application as well as to your database. So the very first being disposability. Uh, what that means is that anytime I want uh, my, my node goes away, um, the rest of the service can still function and serve. Um, the second is about API symmetry. No matter which node which is serving the cluster, I inquire it, I ask, it gives me back the same reply. So that's API symmetry. And then the next, which is shared nothing. So this part is a bit debatable. So uh, by shared nothing, it means that you don't rely on a coordinator. So uh, in some distributed systems, they make use of a central coordinator to kind of check the health state of the others. And it relays messages uh, to the others to say who can do the writes, who should re return the reads and whatnot. Uh, why I say this is a bit of a, a contentious. The fact being uh, Kubernetes itself relies on uh, such a mediator. So the problem with having a mediator like such is it becomes a single point of failure. So if that uh, mediator dies, the entire cluster goes into chaos. Uh, I haven't actually researched how Kubernetes handles those kind of situations though. And then obviously horizontal scaling, I can on demand uh, spin up as many clusters as I wish and they could be able to talk to one another uh, and offload um, transaction load from uh, the different clusters. So now today I have three nodes. I get a certain kind of performance. If I spin up two, mo two more nodes, I should see at least a 20% uh, reduction in performance, I mean increase in performance. So that's, that's the, the, the idea of Dash. So disposability, API symmetry, shared nothing, horizontal scaling. So why CockroachDB? Um, uh, so this is the guarantee that they provide. I think the thing that which is sexiest for me, uh, because I primarily work with uh, institutions which are bank, uh, if you care about your money, you want your transaction to go in and you know that your transaction is durable and no funny thing happens with that. So consistency is the thing which is high up for me and it is one of the um, promise of new SQL uh, solutions like CockroachDB. Uh, they claim to be scalable and they claim to be survivable. We'll see that uh, in the next few slides. So there's a whole bunch of things that they talk about. These are the, the, the basis of uh, uh, their motto of developing this. Basically, they make it easy for you to run your clusters. Uh, anyone use Oracle before and try to do distribution? If you've been from the late 1990s, uh, there's this solution that Oracle sells, which is called Oracle REC. And it costs you an arm and a leg. And, and you need to purchase different boxes, uh, which had different services that you have to install. And each of those comes with a license. With CockroachDB, it's one binary. You deploy it equally in those nodes that you need to uh, run. And it gives you the same kind of capability as Oracle REC. Um, and uh, on top of that, it basically uh, allows uh, you to have ACID transactions. So by ACID, which is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So by atomicity, I, uh, you guys understand atomicity, right? So basically, uh, the transaction either all happens or none happens at all. Uh, consistency is if a, 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 a data state is to happen uh, for my data, it needs to pass all the constraints that is defined in the table structure, indexes, constraint, whatever. Isolation meaning that if I were to allow concurrent execution to happen, the state of the database should be the same as if I've run them in a serial mode. And finally, durability. So a transaction which is committed and there's power failure, and I come back up, it should still be there. So that's, that's the guarantee that uh, uh, Cockroach uh, promises. Um, and it handles data replication for you, which is the plus, which I think people who are familiar with uh, NoSQL already understands that. Uh, however, it allows you to have multi-active writes, uh, which has guarantee of consistency, which MongoDB doesn't have that, uh, last I know. And obviously flexible deployment, so it's very easy. Just spin up a node and uh, uh, define who you want to connect to, and that's it. And one thing, this thing, the support of SQL, I don't know how important this is to you. For me, this allows me 
to today develop an application, say, in Java, in Ruby, in Elixir, and I use Acto using the Postgres uh, driver, and I can interact with it using SQL or whatever wrapper that you are familiar with, and it gives me the same kind of response. Underneath of Postgre uh, Cockroach is basically key value stores but they created a high-performance SQL uh, wrapper, so any interactions goes through SQL only. Uh, it may be a plus, it may be a, something that people don't like, so I, I prefer familiarity. So again, this is opinions. So, yeah, uh, talking about consistency, right? So, um, this was uh, a paper that was written uh, back in the time when uh, uh, the Bitcoin crisis, there was a bunch of coins that were lost. Uh, there was some big hoo-ha uh, written uh, to kind of um, give a bad, bad name to, to some of the NoSQL implementation. So basically, uh, 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 solutions like MongoDB, Cassandra and React, which was considered as first generation uh, or second gen generation NoSQL back then, uh, however, I understand that Cassandra and uh, ScyllaDB today uh, provides a tunable consistency uh, configuration. So, uh, and it comes with some drawback as well. So going forward, uh, let's talk a bit about... Uh, So, um, CockroachDB uses uh, the RAF protocol for uh, con consensus replication. So, there are basically two replication um, uh, protocol that's uh, the, the standard of the day. Paxos being one of them. The other one is uh, RAF. Uh, so, a lot has been written about Paxos and it's mostly in the industry considered academic. Uh, main, uh, mainly because of uh, its uh, difficulty in implementing all uh, the requirements of the Paxos requirements. So, Spana itself, CockroachDB, and uh, uh, more, more of those uh, new SQL implementations that came along, they have chosen to use a RAP protocol. So, what it does is that uh, uh, you define a minimum number of uh, quorum of nodes, which are replicas, that should agree that a written data is considered written. So what that happens is that uh, um, when a writes go into a leader, uh, the writes actually gets replicated to the replicas. And when all of them reports back to the leader to say that I'm done, then does that commit happens. So uh, in uh, CockroachDB, uh, it has two concepts, one which is known as the lease holder and one which is the rough leader. So the lease holder is in charge of returning values which clients request for and this lease uh, holder is uh, distributed among the nodes. So no one node is a lease holder. Similarly for raft leader, it's also distributed amongst the node and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a bit detail of that. And the raft holder is the one who decides uh, whether a rights is considered complete. And most of the time the lease holder and the raft holder are the same. So does that mean the rights are expensive because... Yes, there is a certain cost to that. Uh, but there's a bunch of uh, optimization that's done which... Uh, so I started looking at uh, CockroachDB back in uh, early 2016 and that was still I think in the 
uh, 1.0 going to 2.0 phase. It was horrible. There was a lot of bad things written about it. In the most recent release, which came out in June 2018, I think, uh, they've actually claimed that they're 50 times more performant than Amazon Aurora. They've actually got papers to back that. And uh, again, opinions, uh, also not something that I've actually done real tests against. And at the fraction of a cost to run Amazon Aurora. Uh, and at the same time, so uh, talking about leaseholder and rough leader, remember I mentioned that there, shouldn't, uh, there should be a shared nothing principle. Uh, so you may ask, so then why are you talking about rough leader and leaseholder now? So this rough leader and leaseholder is basically shared amongst the nodes. So we've got three nodes. So what CockroachDB does is that every writes uh, is being spread across ranges. So when a data goes into um, CockroachDB, uh, the, the, the ID that's given is given a range. Uh, each range does not spend more than 64 MB. If it spends more than 64 MB, it's basically split up and then it ex actually decides to move that to other nodes. So there are, there are uh, so-called um, uh, caregivers who are leaseholders and rough leaders for a range of data sets. That's why they can achieve that. So in, in, in a three node uh, configuration, there might be a dozen of them depending on your data size and whatnot. So um, you may ask, so uh, how do you actually test uh, consistency? How do you actually prove that it is uh, the uh, database I can trust? So anyone who's actually done any research on distributed database systems should be familiar with this guy called Jepson, Jepson Effer. Um, so CockroachDB on version 1.0 before going to 2.0 beta, they started taking those tests and then they started adding new test suite uh, to, to kind of... Uh, so Jepson started with NoSQL and there was some transactions type which the test suite did not cover. So they did their own set, set of tests, they open sourced that and then published it to Jepson and then when they were ready in 2.0, they actually invited Jepson to take the, the application and then to run the test against that. So there were a bunch of tests, the most recent being uh, uh, lessons which they have learned in the last two years, basically uh, uh, talking about things which are false negatives uh, uh, in the CAP world. So basically Jepson's test uh, allows you to test uh, the limits of CAP. So in the CAP theor theorem, we talk about consistency uh, on partitioning or you talk about availability on partitioning. And Cockroach stand on that is basically, they are on the CP side of the CAP uh, uh, spectrum. So they prefer to have uh, consistency. And when there's partition, uh, they feel that network partitioning is a problem which can be better solved using networking to, to improve your networking capability and such. So Google was able to do that because when the Spana project was there, they had control over their networking in the data center. So what Cockroach did was they adapt, adopted that same philosophy. Uh, and also to them, uh, consistency is something which they felt which is close to heart and important. So there were a bunch of those tests. Um, if you're interested, you can click on those, those links and read up more about the different type of tests uh, that they have. Most of them are basically chaos. So basically they test concurrency and then they uh, when, 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 when a network partition happens, or they test that when a node goes down, when the uh, leader re-election happens, uh, what happens, those kind of stuff. So, again. So I'll show some code now. Uh, so there's basically a couple of branches which I've added. Um, to my tests, oops, come on. So the master branch of this uh, solution I have basically runs off uh, Postgres. Uh, what I want to demonstrate is that for the same code base that you have written for Postgres, you can easily migrate it to CockroachDB. So I'm going to start a local Postgres instance. Then I'm going to start a local Phoenix, and then I would be able to so this is the 
to what happened here. Okay, so uh, this is uh, to show the code. Um, what I've used is basically uh, the Postgres um, driver, uh, but it's this is based on actual 3.0. So to use the yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So the main difference is, uh, not the main difference, but the main thing is that when you are using uh, Postgres with the latest uh, Phoenix, you're actually using the 3.0. So when you switch to the, the Postgres CDB, which is the Cockroach uh, driver, uh, the, the Postgres uh, Acto driver, uh, com com uh, equivalent driver, uh, you have to switch to another uh, uh, version of Acto. So in this case, uh, what I have is I've also deployed the same application on Gigalixer. So um, you can see that it's a free instance of uh, Postgres uh, with some configuration data over here. And I should be able to hit the same endpoint. So this is the same endpoint, same application, different data. Uh, trivial application so I'm gonna switch to um, running this using uh, give me a minute so this is a uh, same application different branch uh, running um, uh, cockroach DB so let me just turn off And in my Elixir uh, distillery deployment, I've actually created a layer which will deploy uh, a command to start up my local cockroach uh, uh, cluster. So this is actually being deployed uh, using the <coughs> semantics of uh, a release package. So that command goes into commands. It's just a bunch of uh, shell script. Uh, so this starts up the first node second node and then the third node so to check that i've got my instances up and running uh, so when you start up one instance of uh, cockroach it actually provides you with a visual interface to your application your database and i've actually got three instances running here so this is all in one so no special configuration to get this running uh, you just uh, on startup so if I can show the script So this is just the command. Um, so the first line basically allows you to run the first instance and default it runs the web application on 8080 and then you specify the other ports which the web application is available. So let's say you've got three different uh, regions where you're running your uh, EC2 instance or your G GCP instances, then you could actually run them on the same port. Uh, this is the port which uh, serves your database uh, request and this is the port which actually provides the web interface to CockroachDB. So equally I could go into uh, 8081 and I can see the same thing and it gives you a view of your database um, and some metrics uh, that's going on. Ah okay cool thanks yeah thank you. 
so that's the application and then going back so what has changed um, to run this uh, notice I've actually switched to Postgrex uh, but it's the CDB version there's override this is the version and Ecto has now been downgraded to 2.2 so equivalently your app should still work with Postgres now and it should also work with uh, Cockroach the only caveat uh, when you do data porting so let's say you started the application on Postgres if you have using sequence number for your IDs uh, Postgres actually uses things like uh, 1234 and whatnot when you switch to Cockroach DB, it generates that ID using its own unique identifier, uh, unique identifier generator, which is like uh, for the 64 megabyte range and whatnot. So these are tiny things which um, you need to be aware of when you're importing and exporting your data. Um, so going back, um, what did I want to do? Okay, um, so now I've got three instances. I can show you how I can actually log into each of them and I can actually have a, so this, uh, if you can, oh my God, how do I do this? Um, let me try and move this down. Is this better? Let me try and move this to the right a little bit. Okay, so I'm trying to connect uh, to the SQL CLI on port 26257 and that's the first node that I started with and then I can do the same to go to the second node uh, so this connects to 258 and this connects to uh, 259 I hope you can see it and equally I could um, show databases You can see these are the different databases I have. And I can switch into each of them. So these are familiar uh, queries. And yeah, I shall not be belay the point, but uh, that's, that's, that's what it does. Did you type uh, my yes, it is exactly that. So that's, that's, that's nothing which is peculiar. So if you're familiar with PSQL, then this is uh, something that's familiar. So what I'm going to do now, uh, the demonstration is I'm going to start up three instances of Phoenix, uh, each serving at different ports. So this would run at no. So the very first one will start up on port 7000, connecting to this instance of uh, the node. This will connect to the second one. What happened here?
and I'm gonna try and uh, hit my machine uh, so what do I have uh, using insomnia to do some testing um, so I've got a few uh, test cases so first I'm gonna do a sign in so you notice that this hits uh, port 7000 sorry hope you can see this um, this is where the thing is and after I do that um, because I've secured this over JWT I'm gonna do a sign in and I'm gonna post so before that let me try and list the available foods so you see that there are two uh, foods being returned how can I make this bigger I'm gonna create one more um, by adding one more food um, so basically I'll create something called for example laksa and it is spicy hot and I need to give the token so it created a record and if I were to go back to uh, my list food I should see laksa being created at the end and if I were to do a select star from foods uh, you should see uh, spicy hot laksa here so this is for the first node and if I were to repeat the same query on the second node you see the same data so replication has actually happened similarly here and if I were to change my API endpoint to query from the third node I should expect the same result coming back from the third node as well so you will see that it actually hit the third node so what that means is that if you have a load balancer in front of your application and if you've got some rules to distribute the uh, the loads going to whichever machine uh, it can actually write to any of the backend data cluster and um, furthermore uh, cockroach has an intelligent <coughs> capability to understand where the most traffic is coming from so if you've got a load balancer which is always redirecting uh, German traffic to a node which you are running in uh, the European region then it will try and move more, more data there so that you get better data locality and better response times coming back from that and at the same time if it finds that uh, the load uh, on that particular machine is getting too much it will try and start to distribute that so its first primary uh, responsibility is returning uh, moving data to locality which are served uh, or written to more frequently so that it gets the lowest latency and then its secondary premise is if it's overloaded and there's too much writes it tries to distribute that out uh, first based off the 64 MB uh, requirement for a range and secondary you will check for its other siblings which are less loaded and it will distribute that out as well and uh, Ideally, uh, what Cockroach claims is that if you were to spin off more nodes, it's able to distribute this reads and writes. And you can imagine if you have a more fanciful load balancer design, then you can use that to kind of play to your advantage how you want to distribute out your writes. And when nodes go down, it basically uh, handles elegantly the rough leader, leaseholder election process, and then it distributes the load and if a node goes down so minimum uh, default quorum requirement is three three replicas and let's say you've only run three nodes for a cluster and if one of your nodes go down it's a true partition uh, and basically it will re it will rather have consistency and fail all your rights requests so if you've only got two nodes surviving you won't get any nodes uh, getting rights and that's bad so some people may try and run this with minimally five or six uh, replicas um, and you can decide to set the number of replicas required uh, by, config by configuring um, CockroachDB as well 
So that's that. Uh, one question. Do, do they recommend any load balancing strategy or do they provide a load balancer? No, they don't. So load balancing strategy and such is basically an application tier kind of thing. Um, you can spin like three uh, Phoenix or web applications to hit one cockroach node if you want to. Or you can have different variants of how you want to redirect. Uh, you can even have physical load balancers and then based on the physical load balancers, uh, the load balancers can check where origin IPs come from and then direct requests to whatever. So those are very much left in the hands of the developers. They don't have any recommendations for that. <coughs> so uh, yeah, very quickly, what is needed? So Postgres CDB, uh, this is still under active development and unfortunately it is only available uh, as a plugin to, or uh, it only works with uh, Ecto 2.2. Um, for your test code, uh, you have to switch out the Ecto sandbox with the Ecto replace sandbox. It's transaction management is actually it. Uh, anyone who's used uh, database cleaner in Ruby before, it's similar to the strategy where it actually basically wipes out your database. <laughs> so it's uh, testing wise is a is a lot more expensive. It's not able to do the 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 the, the kind of uh, rewind uh, because there's many tiers of. Uh, uh, transaction logs that is maintaining and for efficiency it, they chose this now this may not be the final implementation but just FYI if you need to change uh, any code that you've written which works with traditional Postgres these are the two things you need to change and this would be in your support classes so uh, the code that I've written have those changes and this is based on recommendation from their official github website and that's it uh, I think that's about it that I have let me see if there's anything else to talk about. Um, yeah, that that's about it. You said that the code only those two things need to change, but does it support like GIS queries? Does it support full text search? The yes. Same level? Yes. The same level? Yeah. To this, uh, exactly. I I'm not entirely right. sure. I have not used all of those, but their guarantee is whatever is supported in Postgres, unless you are using some of the. Um, time series kind of stuff, they highly don't recommend. And okay, yeah, I forgot one important thing. Thank you for asking that question because, in fact, I, before I start talking about this topic, I should uh, caution. So before choosing any database systems, know your data characteristics. CockroachDB, if, you are gonna, if your application uh, leans towards time series data type, CockroachDB highly do not recommend you to, to use them they are more for traditional table kind of relationship and not so much for time series uh, because for you to construct time series queries using sql it gets really really cumbersome uh, they even had a talk and demo where they showed that uh, if you try to do it with redis you can have the same kind of z z ref range series kind of uh, uh, select and query within one page with this it's at least three pages of uh, sql uh, and in between to this, you might look at InfluxDB, uh, which gives you a mix of ability to switch between uh, SQL as well as time series uh, query APIs as well. You also said that there were no correlated temporary strings with the lateral joins in Postgres. Is that a limitation of the driver or CockroachDB? It's the driver currently. And uh, it's still being actively developed and it's open source. They highly welcome people to contribute. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion, which I'm also monitoring. Yeah, that's that's that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is this one hundred percent that ecto compliant? Yes, it is ecto compliant. One hundred percent, or is there just a subset of the compliance? Of the no, it's fully compliant with ecto two. Uh, that's why I say it's ecto two compliant. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't conform to ecto three. And you try to use it with ecto three, they they have not actually migrated with it. And to to be fair, ecto three came out probably late last year, around October range. So they yeah. started developing this much earlier. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more performance improvement and then it, they've broken up uh, the different pieces. You've got Ecto SQL now. So you can use Ecto without SQL, without tables, you, purely for validation and constraints management if you want to. But yeah, they, they, they are not uh, Ecto 3 compliant, but they are fully Ecto 2 compliant. And performance-wise, it's, it's a lot better than... Uh, <coughs> performance-wise, it's a lot better than uh, Postgres? Uh, in which use case? I like to ask because it's use case dependent. That's why you need to do a um, uh, data characterization. 
I would say, uh, and that's their claim again, I've not actually done that kind of test. Because of the availability of horizontal scaling, with Postgres, uh, one of uh, the talks that I've watched, which is a, a presenter uh, who, who's from Uber, they've got 10 million, uh, sorry, 10, yeah, 10 terabytes of data uh, with Postgres um, uh, fully loaded on a max uh, vertical instance of AWS. They could achieve up to about 2,000, uh, 2K reads per second and about uh, 500 writes per second. That's with a volume of uh, 500K data and, uh, sorry, uh, 10 terabyte of data. And again, I don't have real insights into how their data is being structured, how deep is their relationship and all this. So these are basically purely from what I heard. So unless you actually do the real characterization yourself, I wouldn't want to make that kind of statement to say that they are more performant. But they do give you the ability to say, if I need to scale, I'm not limited by the vertical scale which is the problem with uh, traditional RDBMS. You are limited by the vertical size and it costs you a damn lot of money if you want to go down that track. Is there any cloud platform is officially supporting? Uh, ah, so Cockroach, uh, last year, if I beginning of last year, they started offering PaaS service. So you can, uh, same thing like Aurora DB or even RDS you're familiar with, uh, cloud, uh, Google, Google uh, Big Data and Google uh, Database and all those, similar. They provide you with uh, Cockroach on-premise, uh, not on-premise, in the cloud, which is a service which you can buy from them and they manage that for you as well. And they will push out and roll out upgrades and all those, uh, as, which is transparent to you. So as of 2.1, uh, the last publish, they are 50 times more performant than Aurora at a fraction of a cost. I think they are like 0.2 uh, of the cost which you would run on Aurora to get the same kind of performance. But again, uh, that data set is based on a certain type of data that Aurora performed the testing against. They took the same data type and did the, the performance uh, testing against. So again, uh, be cautious, test it with your own use case in your environment and then make the judgment. Yep, that's it. Thank you.